Well, good afternoon all. Welcome to our reaction to the F1 season opening that happened last weekend at Australia, Melbourne's, Melbourne's Albert Park. Traditional opening circuit since 1996. Now this year, we've seen a whole raft of changes and a whole different approach to what's going to happen with the racing on circuit. Good afternoon to your LMP, Mark Croft, for joining me in the box today is Writers Tag and also Smitty156. Good afternoon to the Paria. Good evening. Good evening, Pete. How are you? Yeah, well, it is more like evening and afternoon, I suppose. Yeah, so that's for me. I'm very well, very thank you very much. Uh, for the next bit of time, don't know how long it's going to be, we're going to be doing a review of what happened on track for real. Uh, currently got the F1 2013 game open as a backdrop to see you can have the map of the circuit. Uh, we are interactive here on the Twitch channel, of course. Our chat box is open. So if you want to get any comments out there and your own perspectives, let us know. Get them dropped in there and we'll do our best to get read through them. Uh, one of those tracks this weekend, of course, where many were expecting it to be a bit of a car breaker and we saw a lot more retirements than usual down to actual mechanical failures rather than down to just general lapses in concentration but did you expect as many cars to make it over the line as it actually happened? Um, uh, not really well, uh, I thought maybe kind of at 15 downwards would finish and I was almost there it's 14 cars that finished I think Hey, That's right, yeah. 15, but Bianchi was not classified because he was lapsed so many times. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult if you find yourself getting taken down that much. Um, on the stream, I've just received a link for a picture by Nate X Metal. I can't open that because I'll disturb the viewing stream. Rusty Nuts has also checked in saying evening. Good evening to you there, Rusty. I say, we're going to be talking you through what our responses to the race was. I think the amount that came off was about right. I probably expected a few more failures from the Renault and the Ferrari engine teams. I was surprised to see the Mercedes ones really suffering the most there. It was a bit of a, bit of a shocker because everyone's been talking about how more advanced ahead of everybody else's game they were when it came to the engine. But what we saw what happened with Hamilton is it seems that anyone can be struck down. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Mercedes looked like the most dominant team going in. They weren't qualifying in practice. One and two for Mercedes in the qualifying session. But the man that everyone was hoping to win and expecting to win, Lewis Hamilton, broke down within like five laps and it was Nico Rosberg's moment to take the win. Well, I actually backed Nico Rosberg myself. I expected him to be the one to get the early jump on his teammate. Uh, Hamilton, apart from his debut season really, hasn't really done that well at Albert Park. Um, he got shaded by Jensen Button twice. Um, he's also been uh, often be been in trouble with Alonso back in the day as well. He won in 2008 though. Yeah, I say he did win, but generally his track record's not been brilliant at Albert Park, apart from that one victory. So yeah, I mean, his, his track record's better than most drivers who were there, like, say, Mark Webber, for example. But uh, when you look at the overall performances, particularly related to his teammates, he's never quite had the pace at Albert Park. He's always shown at later tracks in the season. So I expected Rosberg to just have the edge over him in the race trim. Of course, we never got to see how just it was due to the engine going out really but still Rosberg drove pretty much the faultless race managed his pace beautifully reacted to the engine problems and just brought that silver arrow over the line but of course the biggest talking point from the whole thing about the Australia race was the Red Bull and Daniel Ricciardo I have a very short question to ask here what the hell were they thinking uh, Red Bull just being a bunch of ignorant little kids as usual Ricardo and like I have a lot of respect for Adrian Newey. Um, I have a lot because he's been so successful designing the Red Bull car. He's the reason Red Bull's been dominating for so long, and he's made so many famous cars. I think didn't he make the 1992 and 93 Williams? Yeah, it was part of Williams setup. He also did the McLarens as well in the yeah, late 90s. Yeah, exactly. And it, but we've seen what he's done with Red Bull. He's definitely proven himself to be one of the great engineers when it comes to designing the car. Now, for me, the big problem was the whole approach that Red Bull took to this issue. Um, they identified that the fuel, fo fuel flow sensors weren't quite accurate. That's their findings. First of all, they're the only team that came out with this finding. It's not like they had the support of McLaren, it's not like they had support of even a Toro Rosso or any of the other teams up and down the field. No one came out and said, yeah, we are co Red Bull here, there is inconsistency. All the other teams were like, if there is inconsistency, it's up to the FIA to sort it. And of course, we've seen before the problem is, it's like you have to be able to say, if there's a problem with the regulations, you need to prevent, present why there's a problem and get it resolved 
officially and, and correctly. The best example I can think of is the team orders debate. It up until 2010, of course, they weren't legal, they were banned. Until we got that very famous message of Fernando's faster than you confirm you understand, and immediately pulls over. Everyone was in uproar, quite rightly. And then the, Ferrari simply said as the defence was, OK, we broke the rule, but we didn't actually tell him it was a team order, and it happens all the time. Like, you know, we, we saw Multi-21, for instance, of uh, Weber versus Vettel, which wasn't listened to, but that's an example of the kind of code they'd come out with. Like, they could have come out with the fox over the hound, and you'd be able to move over. So, what Ferrari highlighted was, it was complete nonsense, and it needed to be removed. They did that, the official channel. Yes, they broke the rule, but at the same time, they set up the place to get it sorted out. What Red Bull did this time was go, oh, it's definitely wrong and we don't care if the FIA's rules are this we're going to ignore them and as you say that is real arrogance very very irritating very much it would have been, would have been interesting to see if Vettel would have had the same problem in his Red Bull but he retired on that five I think it was well, I mean, it's very likely he would have had the same problem because, I mean, we would have had the inter-team inter data there. And again, that might have reinforced their argument. Say, for example, what like Ricardo's uh, got the same amount of fuel going to the car and their own telemetry, uh, pace-wise shots, they've used pretty much the same, but his car sensor said it was 102 um, kilos, for example, versus 98.1 for Vettel. Just to start, a few fingers are pulled randomly out my arse there. That would show you there is an inconsistency and they would have to investigate that. But the fact is, they're not even given themselves the chance to present it. Don't get Red Bull are part of the Renault manufacturer. So you've got Lotus's data, you've got Toro Rosso's data, you've got Caterham's data. Why didn't they go why haven't they approached Red Renault and said, can you tell us what the fuel flow rates were as a manufacturer? No other data needs to be shared, it's an engine, so they're not going to gain any advantage over the rest of the team because they're all under the same contract. And if then they could say we've all got four different suppliers showing this the fact of the matter is, it will then have more things to their argument. Red Bull, in my opinion, will be petulant, and typical world champions just wanted to bend the world sport to the will. The fact is, you have to abide by the rules. On the screen, Rusty is saying that Red Bull needs to learn they are a team in F1, and must abide by the same rules as every other team, and I totally agree. Stefano Domenicali from Ferrari said that it's up to the FIA and we must support the FIA. Toto Wolff said it's an independent supplier, we have to stick to their rules. So that's two rival principles who are in the same game to win the championship at the same level as Red Bull, who have said, not come out and said, well, the data's wrong, so we're not going to use it. They've gone, even if the data's wrong, we'll use it until more evidence is supplied. Yeah. But Stefano Domenicali, I have his problems, like, pronounce his name sometimes. Like, him and Toto Wolf, they showed great maturity towards the situation where Red Bull were like, it's not fair, it's immature technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course it's immature technology. I mean, you'll have to go back from F1 for all the years to see. I mean, the fly-by-wire braking, that's immature technology. Look at Kobayashi's catering for proof of that. Look at the amount of times that Kimi Raikkonen was struggling with the brakes. But the fact is, it might be immature technology, but it's only going to mature if you develop it. It's like going back to the engines, for instance. Does anyone remember the change from the from the V10s to the V8s? The cars were all over the place at first. There was blow-ups everywhere, and there was people putting the power down at the wrong points. Last year, when did you see an engine fail? Actually, literally, boom, smoke out the back of the car a la Schumacher at Suzuka 2006. Um, I can't remember any time that happened. Exactly. So there you go, there's an example right there. In less than 10 years, because that's the lifespan of the sport for the V8 engines, they've gone from blow-ups all the time in very smoky fashion, a la Takuma Sato at Monaco, a la, you know, all this kind of thing, to them not being remembered at all for failing. So who's, why Red Bull can go on and moan all they like about this fuel sensor technology being immature. It'll go from maybe being a few percent out to being so accurate that it's the new barometer for road cars in the future. And so, so as far as I'm concerned, the immature technology thing is not a defence. And as I say, it's just arrogant. You can't say, oh, um, it's, it's immature technology. We're going to we're gonna ignore it. That's like saying, oh, well, we don't agree that the beam wing's banned. We're going to have one anyway. Yeah, you can't do that. Well, if you can't put aerodynamic pieces in cars where the air rolls banned, why are you able to override the FAA on parts that are standard? Yeah, Red Bull being there, 
Go on, Matos. I would say it's just pretty much hindered Ricardo's not only just his best race, and it's also in the Red Bull, but it's home race as well. It's just completely ruined it for the Australian fans, but also ruined it for him as well. Well, it's interesting actually, there's a lot of people have, well, it's been a bit of a debate online here. Some people have come out with the conspiracy theory approach that Red Bull did it on purpose because Vettel's engine failed and therefore it's a way to make Ricardo think he had the edge and then lose his confidence immediately. Well, Nonsense. Can you imagine well, any team in the world throwing a podium away for the sake of that? Not a chance. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's true, I'm just saying to be fair, Red Bull have always had a bad history of Australians, it seems. Well, if they had such a bad history of them and Australians were such a problem, they wouldn't have picked Daniel Ricciardo. They'd have gone with Jean-Eric Verne, or they'd have gone with one of the other drivers on the open market, like Sergio Perez, for instance. So they might have decided to promote um, someone else from the outside the sport who's uh, not yet had a chance at F1. You know, if, they, if Australians were such a problem, they wouldn't have gone with Daniel Ricciardo. <laughs> it's as simple as that. If, if Australia was the issue, they wouldn't have an Australian racing for them. I'm not saying the country at all, I'm just saying their history of Australian drivers being there, mainly Mark Webber, because no, I'm not sure if there anyone... He Webber is the only Australian else? driver. Yeah. I, no, 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 no. Well, I mean, Ross Dodds agrees with me on the stream, he reckons no team will do that, and I agree. It's like, why would you want to piss away all the TV revenue, all the support from the fans for the sake of that? I don't know any team in the world that do it. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to think anyone would or will. And they did develop Ricardo in the, like, the Red Bull program. Webber didn't, but Ricardo, he got brought from Toro Rosso and all that, so I'm pretty sure they didn't screw him over after finally bringing well, him to exactly. the Well, exactly. So, where this conspiracy theory is originated from, I've seen on quite a few details, but Neil Zaro can doubt is the issue at all. Um, and that Rusty was also chipping in on the Aussie debate, saying it's not actually Red Bull and Aussies that was the issue, it's basically the drivers caused the friction. Well, I mean, the drivers only caused the friction because of the way that Sebastian Vettel drove. You have to remember that when Mark Webber dominated the Nürburgring Grand all he did was talk about the fact that he won his first race and after that carried on with it and yeah I mean like, don't forget um, Vettel infamously ran Weber up the arse at the Fuji Grand Prix in 2007 which possibly denied him his first victory way before he got it but the fact of the matter is they were together and then the whole problem was that Vettel was arrogant enough like you know, going back to the multi-21 debate in Malaysia before he even he got that message do you remember his messages on the team he was like oh Mark he's too slow get him out of the way I was being like a real arrogant prick. Like if I'd have been on the team principal, I'd have gone, if he's that small, bloody pass him. You know, that's the way, I, that's the way I'd have done it if I was a team principal. But evidently, that's Red Bull's problem. I don't think their organisation has got anyone with real spine. Like, could you imagine Ross Braun if he was in control of the team when this whole fuel flow thing? If they'd have got the message from the FIA, your fuel flow, your fuel flow is too high, turn it down, he'd have been like... Well, we're going to have to accept it, but let's try and find the details for later in the season to challenge it. And then they would have gone with a race. Whereas, whereas Hall is like, oh no, we're the four-time world champions, you can't tell us we're wrong. It's nonsense, it's ridiculous. You yeah. think anything would be... Go on, Righteous. Oh, no, you go. No, you go, Righteous. Okay, he's very kind of you. Um, yeah, I was going to say that the major incident that caused the friction between Weber and Vettel was the incident at Istanbul when uh, Weber and Vettel collided and then Vettel retired from the race and Weber went on to continue to get the And we've already lost um, Smitty actually, he's I'm left so the party good. for now. Oh no, it's someone saying you've left. Hmm. I love Xbox Live. It can be so reliable. Uh, so, uh, we're going a bit off the point from Australia talking about the history of Red Bull. So let's move on. Keeping with the podium now, what about Kevin Magnussen? A eh? uh, guy who qualified fourth, did a great job in the wet, but then really surprised because off the line, he almost touched his side swipe Alonso. If you remember the start, he got so much power in the car, Alonso had to take evasive action, but that showed that he wasn't, wasn't scared of anyone racing him. And aside from that, I'd say he drove an absolutely faultless debut and really had underlined why the team had such faith in him replacing Perez. Yeah, Magnussen had a super impressive debut, and before the whole Ricardo disqualified thing came up, I was laughing because it was a, like it mirrored Hamilton's debut at McLaren, where he qualified fourth and finished third, but then it turned out he finished second, so he's actually beaten Hamilton in his debut, and I think he he's up there with the Senna and Villeneuve with the best debuts of all time in F1. 
Yeah, it's like uh, it's the first time since Jacques Villeneuve debuted back in 1996 for Williams that someone has finished second on debut, which is absolutely fantastic. It's a really, really great performance there. And what I like about Magnussen as well is that he was driving with everybody. Like, don't forget, early on, he had the likes of Alonso, he had the likes of Ricardo, Hamilton. He was going wheel to wheel with these guys. Yeah, Hulkenberg as well. Seasoned, experienced drivers, drivers who've got a lot of pace. And he was able to hold his own with them more than hold his own. And the question that on many people's lips is, had Ricardo's fuel flow been at the right level, would Magnussen have closed him down for a proper scrap? I mean, that's all to cast all the what if and uh, he said, she said, her say. But that's an example of what he possibly could have done. Uh, for me, Magnussen certainly underlined his quality. On the stream, Rusty not saying that he believes the young guns this season will shine. Totally right, uh, because Magnussen's definitely leading the charge on that, being the driver for McLaren. But you've got to give credit to Ricardo, who everyone expected would be really blown away and like kind of putting Vettel's shade in the Red Bull you know even if you take away the engine issue in qualifying Ricardo was getting top in Q2 he was uh, top he was Q1 he might have got top as well and then like Vettel was like languishing down in the lower orders really struggling to make it into the top 10 and inevitably failing at the end yeah, Ben. You, you mentioned all these guys that have done really well. You forgot some people. You forgot Nico Hulkenberg and Bottas. Well, this is because I'm working down through the field. This is just me <laughs> talking about the podium. But on the podium, as I said, I think Magnussen really underlined his power here and did an excellent job for McLaren and definitely showed that whether you thought Perez was badly treated or not by being booted out of the team he's definitely showed that he's really got star quality and if he can continue delivering that there's no reason that he can't put the words potential world champion in the future next to his time yeah but I can't see him being a world champion this season but I can no. see Mag Magnussen being a champion of the future He's definitely got that raw pace in him. And it was interesting to see his race versus Jansen Button. Uh, Button, in many ways, showed that he's like the master racer because he really qualified quite poorly. Ended up in P P10 after all the adjustments due to Bottas' mistakes um, and he's uh, kind of carrying over the penalty for Gearbox. Uh, but then, in the race, he went even further outside the top 10. Really struggled. But then really underlined his pace throughout once the prime stint started to so do a really good job and come over within a few seconds of Magnussen. Definitely showed that the old war horse has still got it in him. Yeah. That's reputation, basically. Damp drying, like damp driving conditions, and also just fighting from a low, like part of the grid, say like 15th, say like 11th or something, and going all the way up to a podium or a win. He always seems to do that quite well, but whenever he gets near the front, he always gets bad luck in the races. Indeed. Well, we're going on to you, right, to stand. I mean, sticking with the young guns, uh, what was your appraisal of the guys like Hulkenberg, like Bottas and Kivat, who all were either in their newer races for the teams or even their debuts? What was your opinion? Um, I, I think the young guns do very well. They beat some of the most established guys, such as Grosjean, Malnado, Vettel, Web, uh, Hamilton, mostly down to retirement. But, like you say, Magnussen was out racing a long time, but... Bottas had a great race back in Williams, and um, Kivet, he did very, very well to get ninth place after the disqualification, but again, a point on his debut. Well, I think there's one thing you've got to talk about with Fiat. Let's talk about him for a little while. Um, first first Russian driver on the grid um, since Vitaly Petrov. Um, someone who's really shot the world in many ways. He's gone straight from GP3 into an F1 seat without doing like a season as a tester or anything. He's the first to do that for quite some time. So he's definitely showed his underlying his raw talent there. What also impressed me about Fiat, though, was that he actually had a very long duel with Kimi Raikkonen. Because Raikkonen at one point ended up behind him. I think it was because of the safety car. He got caught out on track, so Raikkonen ended up behind them in the snake. And Fiat held him up for quite some time, went wheel to wheel. Eventually, he lost out to Kimi Raikkonen, but let's not forget, Kimi Raikkonen is an ex-world champion. He was last season's Australian Grand Prix winner, and, more importantly, he's driving a Ferrari. Whereas Fiat is in what looks like a relatively low-grip Scuderia Toro Rosso. So if anyone showed that he's potentially got a lot of pace and potential, Fiat definitely did it for me. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely showing that he's one of the bright stars of the future. Because I mean, in, in qualifying, I, he was only like, was it two positions behind 
Vernon, he out-qualified the likes of Jensen Button, Sebastian Vettel, Kimi Raikkonen, the two Thanks, Lewis's, and everything. And then in the race, everyone was thinking, ah, oh, that Fiat guy and Vern, they're just probably going to, you know, drop back in the grid because they probably had a wet, like, setup on. But no, they were both in the points, and I'm glad that Toro Rosso's getting points because I actually like that team a lot. It's great to see. Uh, Quiet to Fish, one, two, three, four, signing on the stream, saying hello, good afternoon, good evening, good welcome, and all the usual stuff. Of course, get your comments in, your reactions to the race as well. We'll happily go through them, and we'll answer your questions relating to anything else as well, particularly about the future races. Uh, keeping on with the young guns, though, I want to talk about Valtteri Bottas, because he was a driver who really showed the uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in many ways with regards to his race. You have to say that uh, Valtteri Bottas has really done the right thing with Williams. He stuck it out of a really dogged car last season, got some great points in America and in Brazil, and now that Williams have come forward with what looks like a very promising car, won the Martin, complete with the Martini livery. I mean, in qualifying, he did quite well, unfortunate with the gearbox penalty, dropping him back to 15th, but then he was driving absolutely on fire until he over-pushed the car. Rookie error, but either way, he still showed phenomenal pace to be able to recover. Ended up finishing P5 after Ducano's disqualification. Really good performance. He had a fantastic comeback. I can't remember. I think he was chasing Button and Alonso. And yes. Hulkenberg as well at that point. But, um, he got past then, Hulkenberg, I believe. Yeah, later on in the race. But at that point, he was behind the little train that was like forming behind Hulkenberg. Great defending by Hulkenberg as well to keep the world champions off him. But Bottas, I think he made like the same mistake Vettel made in practice, where he like he tapped the barriers, but it didn't look like he did much. But for Bottas, it gave him a puncture. And still, to come back through the field like that and get up to fifth, well, it was technically sixth, but the qualification gave him fifth. That it's fantastic drive. It just shows that Bottas is one hell of a racer. Go on, Bottas. What's your opinions on Valtteri Bottas's race? Um, Bottas had a great race, um, again, like you say, unlucky that he got the uh, gearbox penalty, but the gearbox seemed to cause many hindrances throughout the race for many drivers, um, but to get it up to, I think it was fifth in the end, it's still an amazing drive to even beat people like Kimi Raikkonen, who had a reasonably stable race. Yeah, on the stream, Rusty Nuss says that Bottas was his driver of the day at Australia, and he'll do extremely well this season. I put Bottas as my number two. He lost a few points by kissing the wall, so I would just say that Magnussen shaded driver of the day. But, but again, both young guns, both in the first and second seasons, getting my award for driver of the day over the likes of Fernando Alonso, the likes of Nico Rosberg, the likes of Jensen Button, really shows how much promise the new guys have got. And again, what's really good is what Rusty Nuss is saying, the fact they had the confidence to push after his brother his wheel, proves his head is in the right place definitely that shows he's got the focus to really push and try and get the maximum out of the car, we've seen the likes of Fernando Alonso the likes of Lewis Hamilton really dragging performance from a car that isn't there, so you know, I know the Williams has got performance, but all I'm saying is if you've kissed the wall, a lesser driver would suddenly think about maybe putting themselves a few percent down on all out attack but Bottas definitely was in the racing mood, which is awesome, credit to Fish 1, 2, 3 for me, and while wants us to break um, our little thing up with here, because he's got a question saying I could possibly win the championship tomorrow and what are our thoughts right so I'll hand that one over to you since you're one of the Wednesday drivers um yeah Crazy Fish has been a very good season um he's won most of the races in the F5000 league and XRO um he's from what I've seen he's had a very faultless season um but yeah if he can win the championship tomorrow well done to him uh he fully deserved in my opinion and um all i can say is good luck to him well, keeping with Excite Race and Leaf for just a moment, uh, of course, that's where most of us, most people will be familiar with us free from. Um, we have actually been accepted into the League of Leagues by Co-Pasters, who are running, it's starting tomorrow evening, I believe, Australia 50% distance. A league where racers, two ra racers from each race and league of seven will get the chance to go up against each other, kind of like a shootout of the best leagues. And it's a bit interesting, because we're looking on the entry list on Co-Pasters' website, and there's quite a lot of names I didn't even know of out there, so it'll be interesting to see what these guys bring yeah but um, once again it's like code masters are giving them like a lot of people online the chance the problem is the online is just not that good because you i'm not sure you get the lag bubbles you get pointless penalties which is just programming itself 
um, the connection issues, the co constant disconnections, and I really, it's basically like for drivers racing online in that tournament, it's, they'll be like the V6 engines basically, instead of reliability from the car, it'll be reliability from the connections. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big question here. Uh, what I will do is I'll uh, see what I can puff it all. Crazy Fish one two three four saying he's only had the four wins this season. Well, you don't need a hell of a lot. You just need to be consistent. And if you've got the chance to win the title, two races for the end of the season, that shows you definitely have what it takes. Um, just to get our curiosity, it's side fire people we've not seen yet. The racing leagues outside XRL that are involved and the uh, League of Leagues are AOR, UTR, TRL, US. VRL, IFR, and then Pinnacle. I don't actually know any of these. Uh, I'm guessing AOR or Apex, but I can't think of anybody else it'll be. TRL is Total Racing League. Very good on TRL. No, I said, a I said, I said AOR. Alpha yeah, Oscar yeah. Romeo. So that's, that's Apex Online Racing, I'm guessing. Right, okay, that makes yeah. sense. And TRL I know as well, but the other guys, like I say, Pinnacle, VOR, never heard of them. So it'd be interesting to see what those guys bring to the table. So let's go back to the Australia results then. What did you make of Ferrari's race? Because for me, they've got that horrendous looking car with the Dyson front nose. And... I really thought that the drivers found it a real struggle to compete. Um, you saw, uh, particularly Kimi Raikkonen, he looks a real shadow of his former self when it comes to braking, particularly at turn 9. Yes, Ferrari, the one word really does describe Ferrari, and that's disappointing. Well, I mean, they, they, they did say in the end of the pre-season session in Bahrain that they really didn't know where everybody was, but I would have expected them to be a little more near the front on the pace. Um, I've also showed that I know they did have electrical issues, allegedly, which meant they had to hold back on power, and that's a big problem. But it was like the way they went through the corners. It just looks much more ragged than most of the other cars. But but talking about Alonso, um, he's a driver who's been wanting to be able to compete for the championship. I mean, if Ferrari don't develop the right car for him, could you see him deciding enough's enough and jumping ship? Well, there's been a rumour going around for a while now, mainly because the whole Kimi Raikkonen coming to Ferrari thing, where Alonso was going to leave Ferrari and go to McLaren for 2015. And I think it might be the Honda engines that interest him or something like that. But then, if that's the case, then... Who would leave McLaren? They wouldn't kick out Magnussen. They would only be Button, unless Button's retiring, which he's already hinted at retiring. He said he might not even make 300 races. But if Alonso goes to McLaren, then that's the space of Ferrari, which will neither be taken by Hulkenberg or Bianchi, in my opinion. But what's your opinion on that rumour, Swish? Well, my, the rumour's strong because, um, well, it's a Fernando Alonso is a driver. I think every team principal would say this. If he became available in the open market, you'd throw, the, you'd throw everything you got. You'd throw the kitchen sink at getting his signature. When it comes to drivers being weighted in the field, I believe in the, in the hierarchy, it's Alonso, Hamilton, and whether you love him or hate him, Vettel. I think those three are the top three in terms of ratings. So when they come on the market, they're the drivers everyone wants. Once. And McLaren, we've all seen how many world champions they've had in the past. Mika Hakkinen, Ayrton Senna, Alan Prost, Emerson Fittipaldi, they've had them all. They've had some of the most legendary drivers. So also, I mean, others, when they went to McLaren last time, there was a lot of friction. Whether it was because, the only thing that might cause the problem here is Ron Dennis being back at McLaren. And I don't think he got on with Ron, because Ron Dennis wouldn't amalgamate the car around him as a de facto number one. Now that Team Orders have been banned, though, that might be where he looks to end his career, with the chance to be able to develop Magnussen into something true or special over a few more seasons. Hard to say. On the stream, Rusty was saying he thinks the glory days are over for Kimi. There is far too much talent on the field these days. Yeah, Kimi Raikkonen is a driver I'm very disappointed by, because last season, up until the final few races, he really impressed me. He had a lot of pace in the car. I always liked his brutal honesty in the interviews. I thought he really had the hunger for it, but... Over pre-season testing, he's not been much of himself. He's been quite grouchy. And then on the track this weekend, he was, well, pathetic. I mean, and, and how many drivers spin into a wall because they were on the cool-down lap? Not many drivers have done that before. He must have what? That's what I mean, not many. Can you name any more? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Actually, I can think. Kobayashi did it once. Um. Oh yeah, Alonso did it. He didn't crash though, but he almost crashed. He spun it on the installation lap before this he won. I think it was right, I mean, the, it, installation lap, um, it's, it's something that can happen when you can't buy the grip, but you know, you've just done two laps, one of which is your hot lap. You've been running right close to the wall, you've been as ragged as possible. I don't know anybody who'd have not enough grip to get around at that point. But right, Raikkonen really embarrassed himself that with the, as far as that's concerned. And again, I hope that it's just the first race nerves. I really do. But I'm lacking confidence now. Well, it's like Kimi Raikkonen. I mean, there's new changes in Formula One. Kimi seems to come across as one of those old style drivers. And not, remember, he did have that back surgery. And the last time we saw him, he was like really pissed off with Lotus. That could have took some motivation out of him. And I'm pretty sure with that back surgery, I'm pretty sure he hasn't recovered yet. He's probably still feeling like shit from the back surgery. And I'm, I'm pretty sure after the Australian Grand Prix, his motivation's just been taken away even more. It'll be difficult to know, really. Uh, but moving on then, uh, let's, let's keep on talking about the big front teams. I mean, obviously Red Bull uh, annoyed us with their overall whininess about the engine fuel sensors. Here's a question for you. Mercedes, are they as dominant this season as everyone made them out to be? At one point, Christian Horner believed they may well lap the field twice. Jensen Button says they've got a second to lap over the field. Andrew Benson for BBC Bus Sport thinks they might be unstoppable this season. Is it all doom on if ref one and domination or do you think that gap is a lot closer than it made out to be um i think they're probably just sandbagging their pace first couple of se laps of the season uh might as well just not put out your full performance as of yet because i know throughout the season they're going to be getting more upgrades so they're going to be getting quicker throughout the season as well but obviously unfortunately for them hamilton had two problems over the australian grand prix which obviously hindered him in the race but personally, I think they're just sandbagging their race, uh, their pace. I know they can go well, a lot quicker. No, but you, you, you carry on. But, um, Mercedes, they were pretty much almost a second quicker. Like in qualifying and practice, they were around about nine or eight tenths quicker in the race. Nico Rosberg was saying fastest lap after fastest lap and just dominating. No one could touch him in that race. I mean, we've seen this before, though, where, um, I'd go back to 2012 with McLaren, both Button and Hamilton streaked away at the start. They looked absolutely unstoppable. What where their season went? Actually, they did look stoppable, because Red Bull was still keeping up with them at that point. But qualifying-wise, yeah, McLaren were dominant, but then their cars started becoming a piece of shit and unreliable, and that's probably one of the reasons why Hamilton left. Well, I'll be interested to see if the same thing happens with Mercedes. On the stream, Rusty Nuts doesn't think it's going to be a case of all doom and gloom with Mercedes dominating. But then again, um, a lot of the question is the Red Bull. I mean, they should have got a lot of grub in that car. If they can get on top of their engine management and actually make sure it all conforms, they could be a dangerous team on some of the more traditional circuits that require more grip. Uh, Rusty Nuts also reckons that had Massa not been taken out, he could have been up there fighting for a win. I do agree with that. Uh, both Felipe Massa and Valtteri Bottas, but definitely had a lot of pace in the car at Australia. Now I'm hoping that that pace shows again for Williams because it's about time that Williams had a proper, proper good season. They fought so hard, and the, but aside from the false dawn with number 13's victory in Catalonia in 2012, um, they've never really had the chance to get a full, consistent season together. I'd absolutely love for Williams to finally be in with a chance because not since the early 2000s have they really had a proper shot at it. And again, um, on the stream, Jonathan Saunders says hello, hello, hello. Uh, good evening to you. How are you doing? So let's keep on talking about the Williams then. I mean, obviously, they brought the Martini Livery back to F1. I mean, last time I saw that was when it was on the Lancia Rally Cars in World Rallying, which was uh, really quite spectacular. And now they've got a car which really seems to have the pace. Uh, talking about Pastor Maldonado, how much must he be annoying himself at the way he treated Williams last season? I hope he has a lot of regret about that. You've been very understated and restrained here, Smitty. I'm surprised. I'd have expected you to be wanted to be a much more gloating and mean. I just hope he regrets the decision he made. And I hope he feels bad about himself. And I am very happy that his car has been breaking down and he's doing shit.
<laughs> I mean, obviously, like for those who don't remember the end of last season, Pastor Maldonado alienated Twin quite badly. Like, he kept on saying that everyone's been sabotaging the car. Then the mechanics said, hang on, we just make it work. And then he came out with that rather ill-informed statement of, oh, I'm not blaming you, I'm blaming the team. Which is which just brought a really response from me. It's like you really don't understand what you're saying, do you? So, needless to say, um, I'm glad that he might be getting a harsh lesson here in that you can't burn bridges because Bottas and Matt Massa certainly seem to have it. Jonathan Sands on the stream reckons that Bottas for the champion. I tell you what, I bet you get good, good odds for it. I bet you get decent odds on that, so it might be worth a punt if you want to put that five or ten quid down on it. Uh, meantime, Craigsfish1234 is just saying we're asking about private practice, to which he's been not back and declared. Declined. While Rusty Nuts backs up our comments saying that the words face palm come to mind with regards to Maldonado. I don't think anything else needs to be said, really. <laughs> Fair, thank you. Is that all you got to say? Yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> well, one thing I do want to talk about is Force India. They're a team that um, caught me out of the way in many ways because the pace seemed extremely fluctuating. Like, they all like really had a car underneath them in pre season testing. Practice was solid. Hulkenberg did brilliantly well to get his qualifying. But in the race, after the first half, Hulkenberg really started to struggle. And let's not forget what happened with Sergio Perez as well. He was a reject that race, Perez, but Hulkenberg. The reason that he was struggling in the second half is because he said he had like bad tire wear at the end. But still, I have to say, Hulkenberg is up there, in my opinion, for driver of the day. Because once again, in a midfield car, he was fighting up at the front and holding off world champions. He may have lost to them, but he held them off for a very long time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Hulkenberg has definitely underlined his skills over the last two seasons, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a crime that he's not actually in the front running team. He must be the most relieved man in the pit lane, though, having yeah. been chosen. Um, but I mean, had Maldonado chosen for money terms, how annoyed would he be if he'd have made that switch to Lotus and found it as slow as the Sauber's? Lower than the Sauber's. Exactly. How would he? How would he have? How would he have felt? He must have been. He would have been extremely angry. So he must be the most relieved man in the pit lane. And also, I mean, uh, Perez. He's not doing himself any favors, Sergio Perez. He seems to always have this great pace over a short distance. But in a race, he just seems to get tricky and out of his depth a little bit. He just doesn't seem to be able to strung it all together. It's like loads of potential and promise, but just doesn't deliver. In the 2012 season, uh, Perez had very good race pace, not as good qualifying pace as he showed it in the 2012 Malaysian Grand Prix, where he was challenging one of those for the lead. Yeah, definitely, but as I say, I mean, if you go for his results as a whole, I mean, go back to Abu Dhabi last season, when he almost lost out to Jensen Button, despite JB having a serious problem with his car and having to drive around it. Let's not forget as well that, apart from India, uh, where he came fifth, Perez really had very poor results in McLaren, and while that car wasn't very good, he still didn't seem to have the overall pace. And I do think, I have a lot of people who thought he was very harshly treated by McLaren, but I haven't seen what he's done so far for Force India, maybe Maybe I'm wrong on this. He's really going to have to pull his socks up here in Paris if he wants to have a chance to be fighting for any of the front row seats. Perez, Perez, just to be honest, I thought Hulkenberg deserved that McLaren seat more than Perez did. He probably would be able to drive around that McLaren a lot more than Perez did. Still, I did, I do think Perez was harshly done by McLaren, but what we see from him for India right now, he just seems like a driver that's just there. And I think he doesn't deserve that one point he got from Ricardo's disqualification. I do agree with you there. I thought that his um, drive was really quite poor for Force India, and I don't think that he deserved the points. But we've seen that before. Drivers get things they don't deserve. It's happened many times. On the stream, Jonathan Saunders chips in regarding Paris. Says that it was good with Sauber, but struggled with McLaren. And But with Force India, I think there is a chance. Again, you're quite right there, Jonathan. He, he has a chance. He's got off on the back foot. Um, it'll be a test of his character now in relation to his teammate because the Hulkenberg quite rightly will be getting all the plaudits from that fighting for fourth place all the way along he didn't finish there in the end due to great pace on the likes of Button Alonso and Bottas but the fact of the matter is in a car that was inferior he really took the fight to them and was comfortably ahead of Kimber Raikkonen Jonoric Verne and Kivat at the end of the points so he really cemented his position there now Perez meantime snuck into the points by virtue of a disqualification so he's been seen 
already is more fortunate than he deserved to be. Very lucky. He's already got those rather negative connotation words going around him. It's going to be a real test of Perez's character if he can bounce back in Malaysia. I'm just going to add to the McLaren Perez debate. Um, I, I believe McLaren were in the right because if you think back to the real world, if someone is working under you for employment is not doing a good job, you'd obviously give them the sack after a while. Perez wasn't giving them the results, and therefore McLaren has, I believe, the right to sack him. He, he wasn't doing the job. It's, well, I mean, it, I, I do think it's a bit harsh to say he wasn't doing the job, because the fact of the matter is, the car McLaren gave him to do the job was inferior to quite a lot of the cars around it. The only reason they ended up finishing ahead of Force India was because the tyres were changed. Had the tyres not been changed, it's quite likely McLaren would have finished behind Force India last season. So that underlines just how, look how many times Button struggled. He really found it very hard going to drive as well, and he's a respected world champion. So I think uh, Perez was harshly done by and he now needs to show that McLaren were wrong to boot him out by being able to put a really solid series of points together and if he can beat Hulkenberg as the season goes on that's an extremely good barometer but that's not going to be easy on the screen Jonathan Sanders says we've only seen one race but he has a chance so there's Magnussen and Bottas probably the best way of summing that up really the new guys and the younger guns have definitely proven they've got what it takes here well, let's move further back through the field I want to talk about the struggles that Cater and Mauricio had. I mean, Cater, for me, they were like, almost like the rejects of the weekend at first because they missed an entire day's practice on the Friday and barely strung it together. But then, well, what about that sterling effort in qualifying from Kobe Ashi to end up starting 14th on the grid? Did a really good job, she. Okay, one more time, please. <laughs> Okay, well, I say it was a good job to get there. I mean, the car was obviously um, lacking the grip. It was in wet conditions. Um, also, a big shout-out to Marcus Eriksson, who almost got, got in as well. And Max Chilton, too. He very nearly qualified in Q2. He was only about a couple of tenths off Colby Ash's pace. So the Mauricio definitely showed it was competitive. But in the race, I mean, Caterham's rear brakes... What a mistake that was, because everyone thought Kobe Ashi had just completely undershot his braking for turn one, and even he himself was saying he was to blame in interviews. You have Massa demanding that he was banned because of his poor driving, and then afterwards there's um, a technical analyst that shows actually the rear brakes failed, and that's that's a real hair-raising hair thing. With the new fly-by-wire braking systems, that accident should show just why there's a lot of development required on those brakes. What do you guys shame. think? I was going to say, it's a shame for Kobayashi, because he comes back, he's thinking, okay, I'm in the back team, I don't I don't think I should be expecting much. But then he ends up qualifying 15th, ends up putting 14th because of Baltas' penalty, and he's thinking, well, I actually have a chance of getting a good result today for the team and being Marussia, and I might get a seat for the next season. And then that crash happens, and it probably just completely took away his confidence for the rest of the day until he found out it was actually the braking failed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Kobayashi is a good, very good driver. We've seen that in the past. Like in Suzuka 2010 with his brilliant passing at the happening, showing as a late breaker he can definitely do that. But it has to be said, the braking was absolutely petrifying. As for Marussia though, um, well, their grid star was one of the worst I've ever seen. Both drivers having software glitches to cut their engines. And as a result of that, Joe Bianchi, God, rest, God bless him, ended up something like seven laps off the off the finish at the end. And Chilton, he was very much behind the eight ball as well. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame for Marussia. They had a very good end for the season last year. I think they even finished ahead of Caterham in the standings, which was the first time they've ever yeah, done Yeah, job. And uh, to have such a poor start and obviously a poor race is pretty surprising to see they got more money to ever develop the car. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that the regulations come at the wrong time. When the regulations change, all your data starts to go old hat and you have to re recalibrate it all. The extra money will have helped, but it's definitely not what they needed. Um, on the street, Jonathan Sanders says, Marussia, Marussia, never good reliability, and he reckons that Chilton needs to be in a team like Force India or Toro Rosso because he's a good driver. 
Well, um, interesting point of view because the prevalent thought in the F1 paddock is that Jules Bianchi easily has his beating. Well, when Kobayashi was being lapped around about maybe eight or nine times by the field, I'm pretty sure they said this in the commentary and that Kobayashi, no, not Kobayashi, what was it? Kobayashi Bianchi <laughs> and lapped himself like four times on Max Chilton. And if that's the, if that's the case, I mean, like that's a that, that's a shocking difference in time. That'd be almost five minutes of track time difference. I don't think it could be that bad, but I know he gained at least one lap on his teammate, unlapped himself, and carried on round. So that shows that the Brianki's got a lot of talent and definitely wants to watch for the future. Yeah, but, and you want it? Go on. But um. Well, Joe Vassalos, meanwhile, says, look at his records, never retired in any F1 race. Yeah, he's never retired. But that, that can be taken both as a positive and a negative. The positive is, yes, he'll drive within the car and make sure he doesn't do too much to push it. But the second time, if he's getting unlapped by a Simo who starts laps behind him and he's nowhere near getting the points, then he's in the wrong discipline. That kind of discipline is brilliant if you're someone driving in the World Endurance Championship and you're expecting to be racing at tracks like Le Mans and Sebring and the Silverstone 8 hours and so forth. But if you're going to be in F1, which is a two-hour race, maximum all-out attack, being so much off your teammate can be a pain. And Bianchi as well had problems in qualifying, and he still only ended up half a second be off his pace despite an engine problem. So, I'd really shout to me, Schultz the one who's got a lot to deliver, and if he doesn't do it, I think he's going to be shown the door at the end of the season. Yeah, and it's a shame as well, because, um, what was it, Chilton got 13th out of that race, and Bianchi would have got maybe 15th. 14th. Oh, 14th. Oh, wait, did he finish ahead of Eric's then? Uh, yeah, yeah, Eric's retired. Right, but, um, well, Bianchi, because for all we know, that could be the best is going to get that season. And from here on, Bianchi could keep outperforming Chilton, but then everyone's probably going to think, oh, but Chilton beat him in the championships, so obviously he's a better driver, and that could give Bianchi a bad reputation. The similar thing happened with HRC back in 2010, where Karun Chandok got their greatest result, and it wasn't Bruno Senna or Sakon Yamamoto or Christian Kleon that got HRT to that position 10. It was Karun Chandok. Look what happened to him. Exactly. So it just shows that sometimes the history records aren't your best friend. For all you people watching out there, though, give us your opinions on the F1 result. What do you think is all, all the controversies? We talked about the likes of Daniel Ricciardo's disqualification. We talked about the Williams pace. We talked about the Mercedes, whether they're going to be dominant. We talked about the young guns. What else have you got to say? What, have, what comments have you got? Have you got anything related to that or anything to the new points? Get them in the box and we'll do our best to acknowledge and answer them. One of the things I want to talk about this year, actually, is the regulations and the way the cars drive. I really like the fact that the cars have so much torque. Did you see how many drivers were on the ragged edge going through turn two at Albert Park? A lot of them, and the car I see sliding about the most, which I actually, one of the cars I actually love watching the most on board, is the Toro Rosso. And when, when you look at it from non-onboard point of view, the car looks really ugly. When you look at it from an onboard point of view, this is this goes for most of the 2014 cars, except from the Ferrari and the Caterham. It looks like their noses cut off when they're on board. But um, but the other cars, they look beautiful on board, and I love how Toro Rossi, they're always fighting with the car, they're always jiggling about and all that, and it always makes the cars look really good and Ate's like. Well, you saw um, John Eric Verne doing a magnificent looking drift through the final corner as well onto the straight at the Melbourne at Melbourne. And again, passed by Valtteri Bottas, I believe, as a result of it. But it was still mighty impressive car control to rest that back. But one of the things that I turn to, for instance, is normally, if you go on the game, if you've got much of your last season's footage, it's try and put your foot through the front nose with your right foot. You don't have to worry about lifting at all. This year we have the likes of Fernando Alonso even really wrestling the car through there. I liked that. That's one of the things that the sport's missed for so long. Cars where drivers have to have skill. And I can't wait to see what the other drivers who've got too used to it are like. On the screen, Jonathan Saunders asked an interesting question. What are the chances of Bruno Senna coming back? Oh, um, I wish. I should, uh, you're not the only one that wants that or once or is asking that I want Bruno Senna to come back I thought he was unfairly treated at Williams because well Maldonado 
get a win, and it does absolutely shit from there. Bruno Senna, with his consistency of point scoring, that wasn't like top five or anything, but he was only around about ten points behind Maldonado at the end of the season. He would rather have consistency than that one good result and then shit for the rest of the season. And I hoped he was going to get to force injury or something, but he got booed out. But I hope he returns to Formula 1 one day, because I think he's a very impressive driver. Well, I personally can't see him coming back to F1. I mean, he's dovetailing his open wheel, because he's actually going to be um, driving in Formula E. And for those of you interested in that, ITV4 have got the contract to show it in the United Kingdom. So if you're interested in seeing that series, keep an eye out on ITV's news, because they're the ones who are going to be covering it. And if anyone's watched the ITV coverage of the BTCC, they do actually show a lot of what goes on. So if they do get the contract for that, I expect good things from ITV. Uh, on the screen, Crazy Fish 1234, he reckons there's no chance. I am in agreement with Crazy Fish there. I don't see any way for Bruno Senna to come back. Uh, whether he's had consistent results over time or not, the fact is now, in the lower positions, there's so many exciting drivers. I'd say Bruno Senna's ship has most likely sailed. But never, ever say never. Well, most people said the same about Kobe. Actually, they, 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 he's not that. Exactly. Yeah. So ne never say never. That's what I'm all about. You can't ever say that. You know, surprises can happen. But Bruno Senna, I mean, he's gonna have. He's dovetail on the sport. He's uh, putting his hand at Le Mans. He looks like he's doing Formula E. He's uh, done Brazilian touring cars. So he's had a bit of mixing around in all the categories. But to be honest, when it comes to XF1 drivers, I'm on the seat back. The driver I want back on the grid is Jaime Aljusuari. I thought he was really harsh. On Treated by, um, well, everyone would wish for Kubica to come back, but because of the injury to his hand, I don't want to put any false hope. But seriously, if Rob Kubica got fit enough to drive an F1, yes, hell yes, get him back in one of the top teams. I'd absolutely love to see him ragging around those cars that they've got now. It'd be so entertaining to watch. Oh, you know, he'd be very fun to watch in one of those cars, fighting it like crazy on Pablo Montoya. My Paul Montoya would be hilarious, but this is the guy who quit F1 because he couldn't hack it, so anyone with that kind of attitude, I don't want anyone near the sport. Yeah, but still, that's what I, I'm pretty sure that's one of his talents, just the ability to drive a car and fight with it. Imagine Team Radio, it would be hilarious as anything, it would be like, Juan, come in this lap, come in, shut up, I'm fucking driving! It would be something like that. Interesting approach, the, the John Clellan school of driving there, I think, is what he wants to see the return of. But no, it's like, um, going back to like, the, the newer cars then, uh, one of the things I do like as well is that the, it's interesting how much you can hear now. All over the media, you've had Australia's Victor, the, the race organiser saying they're looking to sue the FIA because of the lack of engine noise. But apparently, Bernie Eccleston is horrified at the lack of sound. Personally, I actually really like so I like the fact that you could occasionally hear the circuit tannoy. It was really interesting to see the likes of, you know, all the comments about Ricardo and can he hang on and everything. I thought that was really cool. But the best part for me was that lockup from Nico Hulkenberg. The sound of that lockup on the tire was air raising. It sounded literally like a, a woman really screeching. It was like you could really feel the torture of that tire. And I just thought it was awesome. Yeah, you know what I'm like a, a woman with very long nails screeching it against the blackboard. Well, no, because that's what the V8 engines sounded like all the time. I like that tire sound. I like the fact you could hear the impact on the cars. And that was really cool. Plus, I mean, okay, they might not have the ultimate deaf in your ears noise, but I loved how throaty they sound. You know, when you go through the corners and you hear the whine of the turbo kicking in, you hear the grunts at the back of the cylinders. I really like that. I like the fact that he's actually got some balls in the sound of the engine. The noise of the V8s is just an annoying screech com in comparison. Like yeah, pretty much. It was really, really annoying. So I'm glad that's been banished, to be honest, because I like that. And of course, the great thing about the lack of noise is all these tracks that are under threat because of NIMBYs complaining about the noise. Like Spa, for example, which is always getting into trouble with the local government because of complaints from residents. Guess what? The noise is going. <laughs> Jonathan Saunders says the lockup sounded like motorsport porn. I'm shouldering arms on that one. I'm not debating that one anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so yes, I mean, obviously, what was one of the great things from this race so far then was that we saw the field having a lot of pace in general. Uh, when we go to Malaysia, which is a more traditional track, are you likely to see, in your opinions, one or two cars dominating the field? Um, uh, the uh, line advantage, I'm going to say the Mercedes again. I would say Mercedes and Lotus. No, 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 no. Mercedes and probably. If I had to put a second team that would dominate, I have to go with Williams. To be honest, I mean, I didn't. I don't think we saw their full potential at Australia. No, I agree with that. Williams really seems to have a very, very good car under them that's got predictable grip and power in it. Mercedes, we all know what they're capable of. But the thing about, the thing about Malaysia, though, is the middle and final, the middle sector, very aero dependent. Could Red Bull surprise a few people there and be able to sneak through because of that? It's going to be an interesting race, Malaysia, for that reason. Um, we also saw the effects of rain on um, one final thing as well. Did you notice how in qualifying? It was raining really, really hard in Q3. Probably not much lighter than it was last season. And yet it didn't even, it didn't even stop the session. They carried on to the end. That's good, because then I didn't have to stay up even longer. Like the next day to, like I have to stay up basically, watch qualifying, and I have to stay up even longer to wait for the race because I'd probably be wide awake. I did that last yeah, so, year anyway. So I mean, I have to finally decided that it's going to be a case of let's not make it formula health and safety, and let's make it actual racing. I don't think they're going to go to a point where it's really dangerous that injuries will happen nearly every crash, but I think they're going to you know, go more to the danger side again. Well, interestingly, on the stream, uh, Jonathan Saunders has uh, come out with his prediction for the results in Malaysia. Very bold to hear. He's put, I'm guessing this is a result for Malaysia, otherwise it's just some random driver ranking. He's got Magnussen as one, two and three Hamilton Rosberg, choose your order, four Bottas, and then five Kimi. Judging by the fact that Kimi's included there, it sounds to me like a prediction for Malaysia. To be fair, definitely a possibility, uh, but I'd be surprised if Magnussen's able to beat Hamilton and Rosberg on Malaysia. Purely because of the, the pace in the Mercedes over the middle sector should be greater than the McLaren. But who knows? You might be able to do a uh, Nico Hulkenberg at South Korea last season and have a car as a bullet in a straight line and hold them all off. Yeah, Hulkenberg was the troll of that race at Korea, but still got the job done. He almost did it at Australia as well, was that? Still, he was just a bit unlucky in the pit stops, but um, predictions from Malaysia. If I had to go with a winner, it would probably be one of the Mercedes drivers, but if it was raining in the race, I would put my money on Jensen Button. Well, if, you, if it rains, you put your money on Button and Alonso, definitely. But with regards to the whole driver's drive thing, I'd say the Mercedes guys have it. So anyway, that's our reactions here to the Australia Grand Prix. Uh, we are going to try and come back to you for the Malaysia race. For those of you for the Excite Racing League, if you, there's no race that's been streamed live tonight. But for those of you in the GP3 division, best of luck in your race. Tomorrow night, F5000 is going to be live. Dan Fisk will be covering that on Channel 1 of the Excite Racing League. League. So all of you take tune in there if you're not going to be racing tonight. Otherwise, enjoy. Thank you very much and good night. Goodbye.